Hey everybody, welcome to my masterclass volume three. And uh, I wanted to, in this uh, volume, I wanted to talk with a, a, a friend and a good friend and fellow youth minister, someone I respect very much that's in the field, has a lot of ministry experience, and uh, someone with whom I enjoy talking uh, a lot about ministry, about serving God, about youth ministry, and she brings to the discussion, she brings to the table uh, some things that I, you know, maybe uh, aren't as perfect at or knowledgeable about. Okay, I know you might find that hard to believe, but that is true. Okay, so Christine, welcome to my master class, the round Thank two you, lesson of uh, two people. Okay, so Christine, you are a full time youth minister, uh, a rare breed these days. Oh, for sure. <laughs> but you know what? Uh, being uh, a full-time youth minister in one place, you actually have done some amazing things. Well, I was, for, for the record, I was the youth minister for maybe, I can't remember, seven, eight years before Christine at this parish. And um, Christine was the only person in my 50 years, nearly 50 years of youth ministry that responded to a bulletin notice of I needed staff volunteers. <laughs> so I automatically said, okay, you just take over. I'm out of here. <laughs> I, hopefully there was a little bit of a mentoring that went on. But oh, of course, of course. <laughs> and she's got great natural instincts. And that's how I knew I could move on to some other place and get something started there. But uh, Christine, you do a ton of stuff that I have never gotten to do. And of all those things, the, the, the worship band, middle school ministry, young adult ministry, you do a lot with parents. Um, out of all of it, do you have a favorite? Are you, of all the things you started over there at Good Shepherd, is there anything that you're like, oh man, that's the one I love. I can't imagine doing this without it. I mean, it's really funny because I'd love to be able to say yes. And I know it sounds super cheesy, but I, I don't have a favorite because each ministry has kind of taken on a life of their own in such a beautiful way that like the middle schoolers are like such genuine, awesome, ridiculous human beings that like teenagers don't allow themselves to be as authentic as they are when they're in middle school. And so to have that exposure to them so early on is just such a gift. The young adult ministry has kind of like been shaped by the young adults informing me. Like I really want a young adult women's group so we can share faith together and have like regular connection with each other. And then there's the desire to still be serving their community too. So to have like, occasional service projects which is hard because they're in college or they're working a full-time job and so figuring out ways to tap in to those opportunities on a more infrequent basis than our weekly ministries and worship bands i mean right now because of covid we uh we haven't been able to sing together since march and it has just been uh, a pain for all of us that we, we can't be worshiping God together in that way. Um, but that has just been such a unique and beautiful journey as well. So they're all uniquely uh, beautiful. Okay. Um, yeah, talk about the worship band. Uh, how do you get it started? Uh, there's going to be people watching this master class who may be beginners, okay? Uh, there may be people who've done it for a hundred years and they're looking for enrichment, but I'm thinking most people may be beginners. How do you start something like that? Um, I mean, I think something kind of cool about what I bring to the table in this conversation is like, Tony, you, you were a person of faith from the time that you discovered the or rediscovered the faith in your teenage years. And I don't know how much you talked about that in an earlier, um, videos but in truth for me it, it was a, a much more uh <laughs> jagged journey of coming back into my faith and i think that you know just being open to what your own personal gifts are is so important um leaning into your own 
faith journey is so important. And I think sometimes when you are a cradle Catholic, you don't necessarily think about the importance of that because it's so innate inside of you. Um, but as somebody that that wasn't ingrained in um, from a really young age, really just seeing like, God, where, where are you leading me? Where, what are you pouring into me? Um, just from like a faith-based aspect, because certainly ministry is hard. It's messy. It is difficult at times. So to have that feeling that God is just pulling you there just kind of makes all the hard, messy stuff that much easier, I guess. Um, but really in, in, in terms of like practical action steps, I think the number one most important thing that happened for us at our parish is a pastor that was really supportive. He wanted to see this happen. He wanted to see kids getting involved, more contemporary music. He, he, he wanted this to come to fruition. And so another thing that I would say in terms of practical steps is do it in little baby steps. We started out with one teenager singing one song during communion, and then that was it. And then the next time it was two or three people, and then it was more than just the communion song. And so the worship band did not come to fruition overnight. It was something that we really worked at incrementally. And so I would say, don't be afraid to ask for bold things from your pastor as long as you're willing to do the work is really like what it comes down to uh, uh, in my experience. Uh-huh. Talk a little bit about MSG night. Okay. So, um, I mean, it's not really like a unique idea. I think like there's lots of people that have done it and certainly Jesus broke bread and then gathered for fellowship. So for us, it was all about trying to integrate the Eucharist with the community and sharing bread together. Um, so we have MSG night and people are always like, MSG, oh, what does that mean? And, and you know, they have funny Madison Square Garden and all the other things that uh, that can talk about, but it's mass supper gather. And so we bring together our, our parents and our leaders and our teens there have been times we've had our middle school and our high school together. We've brought middle school, high school, and young adults together. Um, and it has been a really fruitful part of our ministry because it really does engage. This is a youth community, and it isn't just about the teenagers. It's about incorporating their families in the lessons, in the conversation, in the fun memories. And we have done some really, like, funny activities with the parents that, I mean, we did a turkey bowl for Thanksgiving where we were taking a frozen turkey and bowling it at, you know, big water jugs and seeing a priest get a strike as the first person to get a strike. It was like, we were watching Jesus walk on water in that moment. It was like so amazing. The room erupted in like cheers and it was just so cool. Um, and those are memories that are so specific to youth ministry that you can't have them anywhere else. So it's just kind of cool to create those opportunities for like fun that parents don't have to think too hard about. You just show up and we do the work for you and things that like teenagers are kind of like, what parents just did that? Wow. And, and watching the, the clergy and church staff also be a part of that, I think is really important too. Yeah. Yeah, one of the things that I'm, I'm, I wouldn't say envious of you, but maybe envious of you is that you have the support of your parish staff. You know, a lot of youth ministers don't get that. Um, did you do anything to cultivate it, or were they naturally like, we love you, we love the youth, we just want to do as much as we can? Any, any tips on that? I think, you know, the, the, the gift and the curse that you have experienced as such a well-versed youth minister with so many years under your belt is that people probably take for granted you don't need help you don't need support you don't you don't need us to come around because you got this whereas very early on i was forthcoming with my pastor with other associate pastors saying like i don't have this i really want your involvement 
and especially feeding into the sacraments. We, we want you to be a part of this with us. And so throughout the years, I have had some incredible experiences with my, my pastor at the time who is now retired um, with associate pastors that have since come and gone. And so it's been a really beautiful journey. We even had a young adult volunteer that is now in the seminary. So, you know, he comes back every so often and does something with us. So it's just really nice to have that relationship. And again, I think it's me being willing to um, be, be honest about like, there's so much more theologically that a priest can bring to the table than I can in my limited experience. And so it's kind of like, we can be peanut butter and jelly together. <laughs> that, like I, I can provide some things, they can provide some things. And when we come together, we can give them even more greatness. So if I start acting a lot more feeble in my old age, maybe, maybe <laughs> you can get a lot more assistance. <laughs> I don't, I don't think anyone would believe that you were feeble, Tony. Sorry, it's not going to work. <laughs> oh, man. Speaking of feeble... Um, Speaking of feeble, what is this transition? The, the, the church in general feels very incompetent and feeble and helpless and unable to do anything when it comes to young adults. And in our own ways, I think you and I have been we can't abandon these people just because they're finished with youth group. And in my situation, in two of the ministries that I'm in, I've been able to stay in touch. When you say young adults, first of all, some people broaden that all the way to 40, and I don't think that's what you and I are talking about. But once they leave youth ministry, how to keep them connected? Because there's not a lot of other people doing this. Uh, me in uh, one youth ministry, um, there is a young adult group but they speak Spanish and they're older and they're not really that welcoming. Uh, so my pastor's given approval that with the proper uh, sexual abuse prevention training, they can still participate at the same time as the youth. And in the other place, I just meet them one-on-one -on -one at the diner. You know, we have one-on-ones and just check in with each other and give some inspiration or whatever. Uh, but you have a little bit more organized, uh, uh, young adult. Talk, talk a little bit about how you did it and any tips that you would give for somebody that's like, yeah, we can't as a church abandon this age group. Yeah, so for <clears throat> for the Long Island community, the diocese considers uh, young adults 21 to 39, which obviously is a giant age range. And it, I mean, just in that age group, you're looking at college and you're or post-college you're looking at getting a job you're looking at potentially finding your your partner in life and, and maybe having kids and buying your first home i mean there's so many milestones in there that to try to minister to that broad an age has got to be so difficult so although i i do classify young adults <laughs> by the way the diocese does i also broaden it even more um, and so I make it 18. As soon as you graduate from the high school ministry, you are put into our young adult group chat. And that is where they are offered opportunities for, we have a weekly Lexio Divina group. So for the people that are really looking to engage in contemplative prayer, that is available to them. Um, and it is led at our local community center and it's wonderful. And some of our young adults really, um, lead into that so i guess in terms of one practical step i would say really be looking at what are groups that you can experience together um for myself i still fall under the young adult community although of course i am on the higher end of that <laughs> range um and so i am fed by the lexio divina group as well so it's nice to have an opportunity where i can be a participant in that with them and so we can have conversation with me as a participant versus me as a facilitator, which is something that I have found to be very fruitful. Um, if you fall into that age range, you know, and in a couple of years I won't, and then I will need to re-examine. Um, but other, other things are, uh, as I said earlier, just really listening to what it is that they are looking for. There was a handful of young adult women that identified, you know, where 
a few years out of youth ministry now and really missing that community, really missing the opportunity to just share faith, share life and, and connect. Um, and in such a more deep and authentic way, the way youth ministry offers. Um, and so in January, it'll actually be one year for this one group that we have been meeting. Um, we meet monthly, although during the pandemic, we were virtually meeting every two weeks just to stay in touch with each other because obviously when everybody was socially distant and staying at home, um, there was a greater need for connection. Um, but just really, I think another practical step that's important is looking at like when are young adults around, if they are college or they are out of state, they are going to be around the night before Thanksgiving. So we always make sure to get together for the Thanksgiving vigil and then go out to dinner. Um, thinking of like post holidays. So we have done like we went to a hospice center and delivered food and, and um, a cross that we had made and prayed over to um, hospice on New Year's Eve because as everyone else was ringing in the new year, these families were facing some really hard challenges. Um, and, and so just thinking outside of the box in that way, like January is a great time to plan things because they're going to be there for that interim before they go back to college. So just really looking at it and tapping into like, so what is your schedule like? Um, and also very much Tony, what you said about that one-on-one -on -one ministry is so important because there are people that have such different faith struggles when they are in college, when they just get out of college, when they're trying to enter the workforce, that they may not be even attending mass on a regular basis. And so we as young adult ministers become their connection to church. And so sometimes those one-on-ones mean everything. I know I do a lot of one-on-ones with our young adult community as well. Yeah. <clears throat> yes. Speaking of one-on-ones uh, and, and challenges, um, you have been always very committed to making sure that young people with special needs get uh, be, are welcomed and included into your ministry. I always remember that May retreat where there was definitely uh, a young person on there with, with 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 very intense spiritual needs. But you had done so much legwork and preparation and everything to make sure they were able to do a retreat weekend experience. Um, I know it's a personal commitment of yours. I know it's, uh, you know, uh, anything you'd like to say to anybody here, because that is definitely something that a lot of us in the youth ministry field don't have experience with, uh, that maybe you could help. Yeah. Um, I think something that's so important with um, people with special needs, and, and I don't mean to say that in like a broad scope kind of way because obviously everything is individual if you look at the way they are engaged in school they have an individualized education plan an iep and so sometimes youth ministry can become this is what i do for one this is what i do for all and i think what's really important is recognizing if they have an individualized plan at school they probably need an individualized plan for youth group as well and being willing to lean in with the parent with the family what does that look like and I will say I have gone out on a limb and done very, very different things for my kids with special needs, including having people that I have kind of trained as an aid to be of support of uh, our kids that, you know, went through, again, the proper Virtus training and sexual abuse trainings um, to be able to walk with the kids specifically that they had somebody on retreat. Um, I have brought on a, a parent as a part of our volunteer team just to have them close that if their child needs support, they are right there. Um, and in truth, a few years ago, I never, ever would have thought that I would have a parent volunteering with me because it, it creates that feeling of like, they're here and what, what does that mean? But the kids have really responded so well to the situation that we're currently in. Um, in a really beautiful way. And so I would say if there's things <clears throat> that you as a youth minister feel called to, but also challenged by, lean into that calling and lean into that challenge. 
And rather than being um, intimidated by it, just allowing yourself to really negotiate in your heart, what do I need to do to make this work for this person? Because that's really ultimately the most important thing. Yeah. Thank you for uh, <clears throat> reiterating the importance of um, the importance of being flexible in order to best minister to your kids. In one of the other volumes of uh, this master class, I talk about, as you know, working with a parent for the first time in, in 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 youth ministry. I've never ever done that, but in a community where there was a history of her involvement, and I have a language barrier with parents. Um, you know, if I would have held hard and fast to like, no, no parents, uh, you have to adjust. You're constantly adjusting to best serve uh, the Lord and to serve the kids in the ministry. Yeah. And, and I love that you were able to do that because again, I think sometimes once you become more ingrained in ministry or more of like a veteran youth minister, which, you know, with the turnover in youth ministry being what it is. It, it, you you are not only an anomaly, you're a miracle. So, <laughs> but I give you so much credit for that flexibility that you have shown over the years of being able to say, this is what the community needs. I want to take that on. <laughs> well, I'm not that flexible. I mean, there's one group of, <laughs> there's one group of people that you have been willing to engage and incorporate into your ministry that I, and that's the involvement of, uh, a, a parent committee. Um, that frightens me. <laughs> <I don't know. laughs> but you've navigated that. Uh, talk a little bit about why you did it, how to navigate it, pitfalls, anything for some, because I, I, I do agree that the parents' involvement is crucial. And in my ministries, we now have it, whereas I didn't do it years ago. But you really got them in an advisory committee. Uh, so how do you do it? <laughs> <laughs> it it is a beautifully challenging ministry. I I will say that because there are times that you know I ask them to be real with me. I ask them to be honest. Um, when are my ideas too big or too wild or too impractical um we talk about some budget things we talk about some here's my pie in the sky wish guys how do we make it happen and in truth i think that parents are our best and greatest untapped resource and what is challenging is you know youth leaders have so many other aspects of their life they have jobs and and so many other things and this is volunteering and so often the things like okay we're going to be at the church all day long for a bake sale and you know those extra things we need you to bake three dozen cookies like the the adult volunteers may be willing but they're not always able to do every little thing that we want to do and so having those parents that i can tap into and say okay we need this take this idea and mobilize tell all the other parents that we need it as well and sometimes just parents hearing from a parent rather than from the youth minister they're that much more inclined to be helping um not because they don't want to help the youth minister but because a parent just reminds them this is for our kids so let's show up um and so i, I say that it's challenging because there are times that their voices can kind of unite and sometimes in not in accordance with what my idea is or like they're not trying to actively go against me but they're just like no christine you think this is way more important than we do you're wasting your time and energy and resources don't do it and ultimately i think the greatest challenge is i ask these people to attend meetings i ask them to put in like extra time and they often pour in their own um, financial contributions as well. But I think the greatest challenge is ultimately I'm the youth minister. And so there are times that I don't always take their advice exactly the way they give it. And having to reconcile that within myself to not give in to maybe some like people pleasing tendencies that I may have. Um, and also to just help them understand i value you i want you to stay committed and engaged with our community but 
I am the youth minister ultimately, and I am going to prayerfully discern your feedback with my own, where I feel God is calling me and the approval of the pastor and just kind of see where things lie. Um, and so it has to be nurturing the relationships with the parents as well. I mean, everything in youth ministry is relationship. It's relationship to teens and your clergy and your parents. I mean, it's, and your adult leaders always, of course, but really affirming for them, like you didn't just waste your time coming to this meeting, even though I'm not taking your advice is, is I think a really important thing. Um, and also being willing to admit when maybe you're not right. <laughs> there, there have been times that parents have, have given me information that I'm like, yeah, okay, I, I need to think about that. Mm -hmm. um, and then I guess just one other thing related to that is the parents have their finger on the pulse of things that we couldn't possibly have our finger on the pulse of related to like school things and home matters. And so something that I've always tried to live by is the more I know, the better I can minister. And so sometimes a teen can say something and a parent will just happen to mention a similar situation, but they give me a different context. And so sometimes just having the parent advisory board lends to other conversations that I wouldn't be having um, that, that have helped me tremendously in supporting our teens. Yeah. Speaking of supporting uh, our teens, have you ever had a uh, situation where you had to, as the youth minister, serve as an advocate for your kids? Uh, for example, for me, a time that comes to mind is my kids had volunteered at a, uh, a soup, Lenten soup supper event, and were told by one of the adults there, we don't need you, go home. And I came in later because I had a previous commitment, and uh, when I got there, they were all sitting practically crying in the corner with the adult that I had left in charge of them. And I was so angry and appalled. I kind of lost it uh, in front of everybody. I eventually got called in on the carpet by the pastor for the way I lost it. But I was like, my God, you know, um, how could I not stand up for them? Uh, you know, what you ever want a, a young person. And one of them, it was his 18th birthday that day. And he spent it showing up to help at his church and be told, we don't need you. And that should never happen to kids. Have you ever had a situation where you had to be an advocate for them or uh, stand up for their position in the world? Yeah, um, I, I have had to advocate for them in several like group senses, the, the way you talked about. And I've also advocated for for kids one-on-one -on -one as well and just i think the the greatest thing that we are called to do is be an extension of jesus with these kids and so if, if jesus would be walking with the marginalized and would be flipping the table in the temple when things aren't going the way that they are meant to be going by god it is to make people aware of that and and i like you don't always go about it the right way you know like there have definitely been times that i'm like oh cooler, cooler heads should have prevailed in that situation um but i think ultimately i am happy to say i think that my support team my like my leaders and my kids most of my parents uh, know my heart. And so if I do speak out of turn on something more often than not, they are in recognition of, I, I was just trying to serve the needs of the community or of that student to the best of my ability in the best way that I can. But I'm also a flawed human being as we all are. And, you know, I don't always go about it in the best way. So. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> you've been youth minister at Good Shepherd how many years now? uh six years six years have you seen changes in the realm of uh, of ministry <laughs> at all has anything changed in six years or are you pretty much coasting on what you discovered six years ago oh my gosh i mean tony you i cannot imagine the changes that you have seen in youth ministry because if you take my tiny little blip of time in youth ministry and just think about 
all of the ways the landscape has changed between church being i i mean i i just i feel like seven years ago when i was a volunteer we had somebody in our ministry that invited every friend they ever came in contact with you should come to youth group you should come to youth group and they were amazing and they pretty much evangelized the the like 90 percent of our youth group was brought to us by this person and now i i have kids talking about like my school is mainly agnostic or atheist and being a catholic is so countercultural that there's actually a stigma against being catholic or christian in my school I have no idea how to invite people. And that's a conversation that I'm having with students. And so, I mean, that alone is such a giant turn of the tide. And obviously like, it, it's not like it just happened, but it seems to have happened very dramatically just in, in my short time in ministry. And um, I don't know, how about for you? I, I, I know that you have probably seen so many changes to the landscape. But from your perspective, what what is maybe the the largest one that you've seen recently? There's an um, I I I also completely agree with what you just said about the climate, the environment. There's uh, the biggest change I I have to. We've gone completely from there was a world where you actually maybe you can't even imagine this where you used to have to present anything to do with faith and with God as you had to come in from the back door you had to come in from because religion was once shoved down their throats by parents and by adults the biggest change is that their parents don't have faith majority so you're not these kids are not coming to us with a sense of like someone is like we're a catholic family and we want you to live on the right track in your teenage years and we want you to stay connected to god's family and this is important if anything, you know, parents have to be sold on, would you please drive your kids to the youth group, you know, because they, they love coming and they need something. So there's there's a lot of shifts. The other thing I would say is nothing goes away. I mean, things we had years ago, alcohol, drugs, promiscuity, uh, suicide, they didn't go away. But then we added, you know, cutting and eating disorders and vaping and screen addiction and pornography addiction. So you don't ever lose some of the other things that can trap a person, um, but you keep adding more things. And so that that is just keeps increasing. One of the things that I've noticed in the last couple of years that I've never seen before is it's not common, but it's out there and it's a challenge to a youth minister. And that's a rudeness. And, and I hate to say it in the girls, and maybe it's directed at me as a guy, because I'm a guy. It's not common, but I never had it before that you're given no benefit of a doubt. And, you know, just it's, it's, it's acceptable for them to just talk to you in a way which is so disrespectful. Um, I don't know if you've ever run into it, but. Well, yeah. let me let me ask you something, though, because you you are not just a youth minister i'm sure you've shared about your retreat ministries right and so are you encountering this on a week-to-week -week basis with your own kids or is it more the teens that you encounter in your retreats that you are meeting teens that are novel to you and so though that's where the rudeness kind of manifests like where are you seeing it uh that's a good question occasionally in my retreat ministry but definitely present in two of my parish ministries. And again, it's not rampant. But in one case, and I think you know about the case, the group was so rude, we had to disband it. It was like the climate here is just not going to fly. And the pastor and I agreed we needed to just let that thing die. And maybe something would be, you know, reborn later at another time. I'd never seen that before. And in one of my other ministries, I mean, there's just, you know, some some people have to make trouble. Not many. Again, this is not a huge trend. I don't know if you ever yeah. into it. Maybe you can help me deal with it better, but it's not something uh, I enjoy. Yeah, I don't know that I have ever encountered, like, overt rudeness in my groups. 
Um, but something that I encounter all the time with the middle schoolers is just they get so excited and carried away with themselves that they like don't listen at all and you're just kind of like why am i begging for you to, <laughs> to hear like simple directions and it's actually why it took us so long to meet again in person because of covid with our middle school ministry because we we tested it out with our high school ministry and our young adults well before we brought in our middle schoolers we waited till the fall with our middle schoolers but with our high school we were meeting again in june and our young adults i think as early as may we were we were reconvening because i just was so nervous that that excitement and lack of ability to um really pay attention to the adults giving them here's the warnings here's here's the things that you need to be careful of because of covid um but I am happy to say that it has been way better than I anticipated it was going to be yeah. with, with bringing them back. Well, let's talk about the middle school ministry. I, when I was youth minister there, I made several attempts to try and cultivate uh, middle school ministry. There had been no culture for it at all. And basically, in all honesty, there was, because there was no previous culture, uh, how did you break through? How did you, you know, make it work? How did you get it to happen? Um, I think that a grace that is afforded to me by being full time is being able to have conversations with staff and, um, our DRE, I, I partnered with her. Um, so what we did is a pilot program. And again, it goes back to what I said about worship band, go in small steps. Do not try to bite off more than you can chew and then feel overwhelmed and then shrug. Like, I guess this isn't going to work. My gosh, what happened? Um, so we did a six week pilot program during Lent and it was kind of just a very natural thing. Hey, grades six through eight, you can come to us. And a bunch of kids responded and they were excited that like, Hey, now I have an opportunity to come have fun and to pray together. This is great. Um, and also I think intercessory prayer, the, the kind of prayer that both you and I lead in our groups with our, our B and B is unique especially to middle schoolers that they are like you mean i can just talk to god and like connect with my peers at the same time and it's so novel to them and in truth i think middle schoolers are so afraid to share themselves in an authentic way with each other sometimes because there is so much just oh awful garbage that, that happens to a kid in middle school that once they realize this is a safe space and you get to be a part of this, have fun and share your heart, they were locked in, they were sold. And um, we had kind of asked them, we pulled the kids, we pulled the parents, is this something that you want to see full scale? And they said, yes. And so I gathered a team together and I will say our high schoolers that volunteer to be uh, teen mentors, have been integral to that because it isn't just about young adults. It is about the high schoolers mentoring, the college students mentoring, adults mentoring. Um, and so it's like a multi-level mentorship that these middle schoolers get. And I will say currently our middle school ministry is practically double the size of our high school ministry in terms of weekly attendance. Yeah. You talk about the, uh, the teens mentoring the younger kids. Uh, you and I have done leadership retreats together. I talk a little bit about that in my other volume of the master class. Is there anything that you do personally besides, uh, besides like that leadership retreat, anything you do to prepare kids for ministry or take more of a leadership role? Um, I do what we call the leader in training program, and it's like a series of workshops um, it is six workshops that, um, at times I have tried to do one a month and then we can kind of reflect on, so what did you learn in the last month after hands-on experience? Um, but it's been different with every class of kids or like new group of workshop kids, um, that I encounter because I think it's important to do that. And, um, you know, this group of kids that I'm workshopping now, with the pandemic, it has been very, very different. And they're getting way more hands-on experience. Um, 
And also I, I try to specifically for our high schoolers that serve with our middle schoolers, something that I think is really important is really talking about the areas of struggle and the success stories at every like post leader meeting that went really well. I mean, we, we have someone who's now in college, but she was a leader in high school that we had a kid with special needs that was always kind of getting into, I don't want to say trouble, but he was always, <clears throat> he was bigger than all the other kids in middle school and was just kind of a, a little bit of a bull in a china shop, like emotionally speaking and, and maturity wise. And so he really needed somebody to buddy up with him. And every adult that we tried to do it, it just didn't work. He, he didn't respond. But she met him where he was at. And I think that's the beautiful thing of really supporting and encouraging teen mentorship is you know what, what he's into. You, you know, you watch the same shows, you do the same things, you love the same music. Cool. Pour into that. And then you can kind of quietly, discreetly like, hey, come here, just sit down for a second. And that way it isn't them feeling called out by an adult being like hey come here come sit down blah blah, blah. it's just a, a quiet gentle guide versus somebody feeling like oh there's that adult telling me to do something again um so in that way it has been invaluable yeah that's great that, that's great um you know you talk about asking me before like is there changes that i've seen one of the things that's most definitely a factor is the um the drop in maturity of of, of, of young people, um, at least by two years. Within the last half a dozen years uh, is huge factors because it makes uh, training kids to be leaders and to be mentors all the more challenging because you're dealing with somebody who's a, a 10th grader, maturity of an 8th grader. And then you know what else has just happened? Hopefully this video will be watched long beyond 2020 but the thing that's happened in 2020 is that COVID and the um, the uh, quarantine, the lack of interaction, everybody's got another six months less maturity. There's a whole living experience that was missed. So th that that's that's definitely a factor in, in all of this of trying to empower people, young people, to just uh, assume leadership. You have to constantly be looking at what are they ready for, we're trying to challenge them to move forward, but not getting overly frustrated <laughs> with expectations of where people were at that it's just not happening so often. Yeah, there's actually, I'm really glad you brought that up because you and I have talked so much about this just in our conversations of like, man, what are you seeing? What are you seeing together? Um, that something that we have talked about is not just the shift in maturity, but also that notion that there is so much more exposure to things at such an early age. So it's like they are burdened with exposure to worldly things and maybe not always the best things at an earlier and earlier age, but also their maturity. So like their, their content is here and their maturity is here. And how do you bridge that gap is such a challenging thing in ministry. Yeah. And I need to also say this, that at the same time, I'm meeting some 7th and 8th graders. Not many, but a handful that got maturity on high school juniors and seniors. So whatever whatever's going on out there, in some cases, it's causing kids to really grow in maturity real young, and in many cases, delayed. I mean, I've got young adults that, to me, are still, you know, here and here in, in high school it's crazy but it's all over the place it's yeah a broad, broad span of things just just to say something else though about the um the idea of student leaders i think something that has shifted in me in having high schoolers mentor is i have now identified the difference at least for myself of mentors versus student leaders because i think at one point in time i had certain expectations of student leaders and i want you to be able to give input on a meeting and plan things and execute things well and 
be well spoken in front of a group and all of these skills that I think not everybody has. They're just not naturally gifted in that way. And so I had expectations that led to a lot of frustration for me because I was like, why the heck can't you do this? And then just recognizing, you know, something you're the one on one person. You are not the crowd person. You're not the up in front of the room person, but you can walk with these kids in a way that is so beautiful and unique to you. I have to celebrate that gift. And so I realized that part of my mentoring and shaping young leaders was kind of like taking a square peg and shoving it into that round hole. Like I need you to do these things for ministry. And then I recognized my own biases and was like, okay, I need to celebrate their individual gifts a little bit more in order for this to be fruitful. And I think that in my mind, not necessarily even implicitly or explicitly saying this to anybody, but in my mind, negotiating this person's a mentor, this person's a leader has, has helped me tremendously in ministering to those kids. Nice. Thank you. You know, um, one of the things that you and I have in common is um, in a definite affinity for the arts, uh, both for ourselves and in our ministry. And I do talk extensively in one of the masterclass volumes uh, about the importance of bringing art into, um, into ministry and connecting them. Um, but I want to invite you a chance to say what, what you have. I like one of the things I didn't mention was that I've had ministries where a coffee house was like an anchor, a monthly coffee house, because I had a group where they liked to sing and dance and tell jokes and um, and read poems. And that became a real anchor. Um, I use film. Um, now, some people are appalled at a film that I've had a tremendous amount of success with in every single one of my ministries, The Passion of the Christ. At Lent. I've had all different kinds of groups be moved by that. Other people are like, oh, it's so hideously violent. How could you possibly? So everything is different. And our taste, even though we're both artistically orientated, our taste can be very different. Yeah. Mine, definitely mine and your husband's, that's for sure. Um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> who's a film director. But anyway, uh, talk a little bit about the artistic things you've done that have worked. Uh, any tips you would give? Anything at all like that? I mean, it's so funny. Something that like instantly comes to mind is um, the school shooting at uh, Majority Fred, uh, Frederick Douglass. Um, I'm saying it all wrong, but the school shooting that happened on Ash Wednesday, which was also Valentine's Day. Um, and we had an MSG night that was an art meditation and we had parents and students meditate on the image of people on Valentine's day, a day of love and on Ash Wednesday, a day of atonement, um, really reflecting on how has that school shooting affected them maybe differently? How did it resonate differently? than other school shootings that have been so covered in media um and and why did this one just affect you um and we played music that kind of aided them in reaching certain uh depths in their reflection um both secular and uh christian contemporary and then as a group we shared what we created and talked about why we created what we created. And some were incredible images of hope. And we brought in um, a hair dryer and crayons and allowed them to do some like melted wax things. Um, and there were people that had like red crayon melted all over their image. And so it was a very sad image, a very painful image, but they said like, I haven't had anywhere to put all of these feelings. And so then we talked about how art, is not just a meditation it's a prayer and when we are creating we are more deeply united to the creator and so there was feelings that had been unearthed in in light of that art meditation that night with the parents and the, and the teens that we were able to unite in prayer in a way that they hadn't been able to articulate previous to that so i think that's like a really important example of how art and prayer can all go hand in hand together yeah 
I like that imagery you just gave of uh, not having any place to put what's going on inside. And one of the things that you and I both have in common too in our ministries is that we wanted to afford uh, young men and women uh, a chance to uh, maybe separately deal with some of the unique issues that they face. And, um, you know, I call it guys night out, girls night out. And the girls were gathered with the female staff and I would take care of the guys, um, you know, uh, just to talk about issues that they may not bring up when the other opposite sex is there. You want to say anything about how you work it or any tips for somebody who's considering doing that? Um, yeah, I think the, the number one most important thing that I try to do in the girls group and I try to cultivate with our male leaders and, and not always successfully, I will say that for sure. But the thing we aim to do is, is to really look at like what is facing you. And we let them navigate the night. We let them not just navigate it, we let them guide us in what needs to be talked about, what is really on their hearts, what is something that they're seeing in society or something that they're seeing in the church and allowing them to just talk about it. And I think sometimes they might be more hesitant because, as you said, there's there's other people in the group, but um i i have actually in in one of my nights where i did a girl group they actually started talking about ways to get out of challenging situations like if they're at a party or if a guy is getting a little too handsy with them or what have you and we talked about different systems that they have used and worked on with either their friends or their parents to like hey i need you to come now kind of type of things but if they can't say that then they text red, like literally just like a red emoji. And if it's a red of any kind, then the parent knows I need to come get them now kind of thing. Um, so I think in terms of like sharing information in that way, that would have never happened in a mixed gender group. Um, and also just something I want to say about that is in our experience, there have been members of the LGBTQ community and so navigating a girls night guys night um has been challenging because we have um certain kids that don't feel as though they fit into those norms um and so we have had to navigate that sensitively as well